A lot of the food we eat would disappear if not for bees. The problem is, bees seem to be disappearing. If you like to eat, and who doesn't like to eat, thank a bee. Bees help keep our crops alive by moving pollen from one flower to another so plants can produce the food we eat. If you add it up, and bee experts like MSU's Doug Landis and Rufus Isaacs have added it up, we have to thank bees for about a third of the food we eat. But lately, there's a kind of a buzz over the fact that honeybees are disappearing. And we've seen in recent winters maybe 20 to 30 percent reduction of the national uh, number of honeybee colonies. So that gets people concerned about how will we pollinate the crops. Honeybees are actually not native to the U.S. They were brought in from Europe to help plants grow better. There are lots of native bees as well. And while their numbers have been declining a bit, they're in relative abundance. Researchers here at MSU are trying to figure out how to lure more of those native bees to farms. So that we can make farmland more suitable for them, uh, provide growers and farmers with advice on what they could do to their farms to make them more suitable for bees. And um, by doing that, we hope that the farmers are, in the long term, still able to pollinate their crops, even if there's a decline in honeybees or some of these other potential problems continue into the future. Isaacs and Landis and other entomologists at MSU have known about the bee shortages for years. But talk about the effect on food supply is something that's been showing up in the news, so greater attention is being paid to bees. There are also global components to bee decline, something research in these labs is digging into. There's a recent study that's shown that there's more and more crops being planted that are dependent on pollinators, so more fruits and more vegetables being planted, especially as developing countries get some more money and, and move move up the development sequence, they are getting more plantings of nuts and fruits and vegetables, coffee is even pollinated by, uh, by bees as well. And so these crops uh, are, more, are higher value, they can get more return for it, but they have to have the bees there to pollinate it to get that, to get that value. So you know, there's going to be more and more need for bees to pollinate these crops. So when you hear about bees being um, maybe under threat, that definitely gets people's attention. MSU is taking a lead in the research of pollinators. This is a state with a rich heritage of agriculture. MSU has deep roots in ag as well, and bees are intimately connected to those crops. So, it only makes sense. Well, we have a very strong entomology department. I'm a little biased, but um, we, have, we have a lot of entomologists here, and many of us work with specific commodity groups, or sectors of our agriculture. When you look at Michigan fruit crops, many, most of which are dependent on pollination, that's about, about $300 million to the state's economy every year that's dependent on, on these bees, and about the same value for the vegetable crops. So you put those together and you can see that's a, that's a large part of our economy in the state that's dependent on pollination, and so we need to pay attention to make sure we can keep that, uh, keep that going. We also have a few different labs in our department that work on pollination, honeybees, uh, somewhat on the, the issues of biofuels and their implications for pollinators. So we've got a group of faculty and students and postdocs that are all working on these related issues together. The focus on biofuel also means a connection to the land, the plants, and, you guessed it, bees. Some of the crops used to make biofuel also just happen to attract bees. So you plant the crops for biofuel, you get the bees to show up, more bees mean better food crops as well. Win, win, win. Michigan State's a great place to work. It provides a lot of opportunities. I'm part of the uh, Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. This is one of three uh, Department of Energy funded research centers to really uh, jumpstart uh, cellulosic ethanol as a, as a biofuel. And uh, that provides a great platform for doing a lot of work. So one of our interests is, uh, and, I, and I lead a group, looking at what are the biodiversity implications of growing biofuels in agricultural landscapes. If we uh, choose to replace as much as 30% of our liquid fuel needs with biofuels, which is uh, the stated target of the, of the United States, that means we're going to be growing biofuel crops uh, on a lot of area of the landscape. And those crops will change landscape structure, and they might do that in positive ways, or they might do that in negative ways. And so we're looking for win-win scenarios where we can uh, grow a viable biofuel crop for Michigan and maybe other parts of the world that really adds to the ecosystem services that, that we also need to obtain from these landscapes. And those sorts of crops and efforts attract bees and bring some other added benefits. Through this project, we've been comparing corn, which is the current biofuel crop, 
to switchgrass, which is a native plant. And then we've been comparing both of those to mixed prairie, which is uh, a habitat which would have predominated throughout much of southern Michigan. And we're looking at the biodiversity implications of that for plants, for insects, pollinating and predatory insects, uh, for uh, microbes in terms of those that are uh, helpful in regulating greenhouse gas production. And birds and, well, the list goes on. The more different kinds of crops you have, the healthier the lands, and that means more abundant wildlife. Is it possible that we can grow biofuels in the, in the southern Michigan landscape that benefits birds of conservation concern, pollinating insects, predatory insects that could yield services to other parts of the farm landscape, and maybe provide restoration of ecosystems that have uh, largely been lost from the, from the landscape. So it looks to us like we have uh, a really good possibility for a win-win situation. So that's something that we've put out through the web, through MSU's um, websites, and getting a lot, lot of attraction from people around the world, from around the country, to come to MSU and see what, what have we done, and can they adapt that idea to their region of the country. Some of those projects are even going on around the world. It's a great time to, to be at MSU, and it's a great time to be uh, involved in this. We're, we're really, I think, really coming to grips with uh, how we, we live on this earth in a sustainable fashion. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of aspects to that, but it's fun to be involved in, in a small part of it.